This is an ABC News special edition of Viewpoint. Here now, reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. There is, and you probably need it about now, there is some good news. If you can, take a quick look out the window. It's all still there. Your neighborhood is still there, so is Kansas City, and Lawrence, and Chicago, and Moscow, and San Diego, and Vladivostok. What we have all just seen, and this was my third viewing of the movie, what we've seen is sort of a nuclear version of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. Remember Scrooge's nightmare journey into the future with the spirit of Christmas yet to come? When they finally return to the relative comfort of Scrooge's bedroom, the old man asks the spirit the very question that many of us may be asking ourselves right now. Whether, in other words, the vision, the vision that we've just seen is the future as it will be, or only as it may be. Is there still time? To discuss, and I do mean discuss, not debate, that and related questions tonight, we are joined here in Washington by a live audience and a distinguished panel of guests. Former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Elie Wiesel, philosopher, theologian, and author on the subject of the Holocaust. William F. Buckley, Jr., publisher of the National Review, author, and columnist. Carl Sagan, astronomer and author who most recently played a leading role in a major scientific study on the effects of nuclear war. Lieutenant General Brent Scowcroft, National Security Advisor to President Ford, Chairman of President Reagan's Bipartisan Commission on the MX Missile. And former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who wrote in the current edition of Foreign Affairs that nuclear weapons are totally useless except only to deter one's opponent from using them. That's our panel, and you'll be hearing from them in just a few moments. But first, joining us live from his home in suburban Washington is the Secretary of State, Mr. George Schultz. Mr. Secretary, if I put to you the question that Scrooge put to the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future as we've just viewed it tonight, is that the future as it will be or only the future as it may be? Neither. That is not the future at all. The film is a vivid and dramatic portrayal of the fact that nuclear war is simply not acceptable. And that fact and the realization of it has been the basis for the policy of the United States for decades now, the successful policy of the United States, based on the idea that we simply do not accept a nuclear war and we've been successful in preventing it. Mr. Schultz, that is the answer of a Secretary of State to a reporter, and that's fair enough, because that's what you and I respectively are. But what if you were answering the question to your son or to your granddaughter? What would a grandfather, what would a George Schultz who is talking to a member of his family say in response to the same question? Same answer? Well, I would give the same answer. And since uh, children these days are in many respects smarter, it seems to me, than uh, their elders, they would ask a lot of questions about that. And I think it's possible to explain why it is that it's possible to have a policy that prevents nuclear war. I guess what some of those smart youngsters are worried about and what a lot of smart older people are worried about too is not so much the policy but just the presence of so many nuclear weapons, so many nuclear warheads in the world, and the question, which I now address to you, with so many of them, is it not inevitable that at some point or another they will be used? And if not, why do we need them? The only reason that we have nuclear weapons, as President Reagan said in uh, Japan recently, is to see to it that they aren't used. We have to provide a balance so that uh, others who have nuclear weapons, particularly the Soviet Union, realize that what could happen to us could happen to them and would happen to them. And under those circumstances, neither we nor they will use these weapons. In this sense, I'm agreeing with the quotation that you gave from Secretary McNamara. But I think we have to do a lot more and do do a lot more we work to reduce the number of these weapons. And it is uh, interesting to note, important to note, that uh, if you go back to the 1960s and compare 
the amount of destructive capability of our nuclear arsenal now as compared with them, then it's about 70% less. The point that I'm trying to make here is that in addition to having this policy of balance and deterrence, we have a policy of reduction. And in President Reagan's efforts to deal with this problem, uh, reduction of nuclear weapons has been at the top of his list. Reduction all the way down to the point of zero. Mr. Secretary, I cannot doubt, nor do I, that that is the President's intention. Why has that policy been so difficult to achieve then? Because since your administration has come into office, there has not been any reduction on either side. Well, no, that's not correct. There have been some reductions as part of a general program to do so, and only last October it was announced that another thousand uh, nuclear weapons or warheads would be taken uh, out of Europe. So that process goes on. But it's also true that the negotiations that have been going on with the Soviet Union, uh, while they haven't produced a result as yet, have focused on reduction. And many people said when the president proposed reductions that uh, he shouldn't do that because the Soviets wouldn't agree to it. Mr. They Secretary haven't agreed, but they have come to the table to talk about the subject. Mr. Secretary, let me focus for a, a couple of minutes at least before we go to our panel here on the movie, which became, in a sense, much more than a movie. It's become a national event. And your presence here this evening uh, is, I think, some testimony to that. Is the movie going to be useful? Well, the movie certainly dramatizes the unacceptability of nuclear warfare. And from my standpoint, it says to those who have criticized the president for seeking reductions that really that's the sensible course to take. And what we should be doing is rallying around and supporting, as I think people by and large more and more are, uh, the idea that we should be trying to reduce the numbers of these weapons. Of course, to do so means that we have to persuade the Soviet Union to come down along with us. And hopefully, uh, what we would shoot for, as the President again said in Tokyo, his dream is to reduce down to zero. There does seem to be a certain amount of, of business as usual, though, Mr. Secretary, in the most lamentable way, by which I mean the Soviets are pointing the finger at us, and we are pointing the finger at them, and somehow the moral imperative of arms reduction is going nowhere. Why? It is uh, a subject that we are working on constantly. We have uh, made some very good and interesting proposals. I think that uh, the point for us is to stay there and keep talking. And the moral imperative that we feel, I'm sure, is felt by others throughout the world, uh, no doubt including people in the Soviet Union. And so if we are persistent and the propositions we put are reasonable as they are, uh, we will eventually get somewhere. Let me bring it back to the family level for a moment. Those mothers and fathers out there who I suspect want a great many answers themselves and would like to be able to give answers to their own children, is there anything that American citizens can do? Is there anything that you would like them to do? And maybe those are two separate questions. Well, I think that uh, clearly this question has been and is and it will continue to be a matter of great importance. And it seems to me the effort to reduce the numbers of these weapons uh, around in the world, here and elsewhere, particularly the Soviet Union, is the right thing to do. And so uh, the more widespread the support is for that and the greater the understanding uh, there is for that, uh, the more chances we have for success. I'm not so sure. I think it is a subject that everyone should be paying attention to and uh, uh, registering in on, and that will be helpful. Well, uh, forgive me, I wasn't asking about paying attention, but whether people can do anything. I mean, other than what I suppose I would have expected you to say, and that is support the president's policy, is there anything else that people can do? Well, it isn't simply the president's policy. The proposals that have been put forth in uh, both of the Geneva negotiations are widely supported. 
the one that deals with so-called intermediate range uh, weapons is based on uh, proposals developed with our allies in Europe and are closely coordinated with members of Congress so that they know what's going on. The same thing can be said for the other discussions that are taking place. In fact, I think it's a fair statement uh, that uh, members of Congress contributed a great deal to the so-called build-down proposal that's the most recent uh, proposal put forward at Geneva by our negotiator, General Rowney. Secretary Schultz, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And so we move now to our panel. And let me begin with you, Mr. Buckley. You have been quite eloquent in your denunciation of the movie that we saw this evening. As usual. Uh, now that you have seen it, uh, do you feel encouraged to, to become even more vociferous in your denunciation, or, or have you found some merit in it? Well, I, I think unhappily the Secretary of State uh, misses the point. The whole point of this movie is to launch an enterprise that seeks to debilitate the America, uh, may, the United States. May I ask States. you just to move in a little oh, closer sure. to your microphone? Uh, it seeks to debilitate <clears throat> the United States. Uh, the, this is terribly plain. The guy who wrote it says, I would like to see people starting to question the value of defending this country with a nuclear arsenal. That is his motive, and people who have seen the film, who have sought um, to debilitate American expense, uh, 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 defenses, have uh, gathered around it. It's become, uh, it's become a, uh, a cause militant. It has a totemic significance. And it's, it's, I'm delighted to hear the Secretary of State say such calm and lucid and cogent things, but that's unrelated to the effort of this film. You think that there is a deliberate political effort behind this film, uh, or, or, or are you prepared to concede that if indeed there is one, it may be accidental? Well, it's certainly deliberate on the part of the writer. He says that was his motives. Now, if you say, was it deliberate on the part of the shareholders of ABC, I, I don't think they were consulted. But um, <clears throat> there, 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 there's no question that people who seek to write tendentious copy write tendentious copy because they seek to forward a particular point of view. I certainly do. All right. Let me raise the question, Carl Sagan. Do you see any merit in this movie, or, or is the movie simply an exercise in emotionalism which may cause despair rather than do anything useful? I think in this country we've uh, been sleepwalking during the last 38 years and uh, passed this problem without really coming to grips with how dire and compelling it is. And I think ABC should be congr congratulated for spurring what I hope will be a year-long debate on this issue. But it's my unhappy duty to uh, point out that the reality is much worse than what what has been portrayed in this movie, and this new emerging reality has significant policy implications. The nuclear winter that will follow even a small nuclear war, especially if uh, cities are targeted, as they almost certainly would be, uh, involves a pall of dust and smoke, which would reduce the temperatures, not just in the northern mid-latitudes, but pretty much globally to sub-freezing temperatures for months. In addition, it's dark. It, the radiation from radioactivity is much more than we've been told before. Agriculture will be wiped out. And uh, it's very clear that uh, beyond the one or two billion people who would be killed directly in a major nuclear war, five, seven thousand megatons, something like that, that uh, the overall consequences would be much more dire. And the biologists who've been uh, studying this think that there is a real possibility of the extinction of the human species from such a war. Let me stop you on that point, because uh, if our viewers were not depressed enough after seeing the movie, I suspect you've brought them to an even greater nadir. Uh, but that, I think that's good news, uh, Mr. Koppel. What is that? What he just said is very good news. Because? If the Soviet Union knows that a first strike is going to mean <coughs> the extinction of the Soviet Union, then there won't be a first strike. I agree with that. I'm amazed yeah. to find myself agreeing with Mr. Buckley, but that's, uh, <laughs> that is absolutely right. Well, in that case, let me, let me capitalize on that brief moment of agreement, because I suspect <laughs> there won't be very many more. Dr. Kissinger, <laughs> let, me, let me turn to you and ask you then if, indeed, one accepts either Dr. Sagan's version or the version that we saw here, we are in either case talking about 
damage and loss of life unparalleled in human history, how is it possible under any circumstances to conceive of the use of nuclear weapons? Well, I think that this film presents a very simple-minded notion of the nuclear problem. And I, uh, it deals with the most obvious question that a general nuclear war aimed at cities is a disaster and a catastrophe. I wrote a book on this subject 30 years ago when the notion of general nuclear war first, first arose. The problem of our period, the problem we have to, gr to grapple with is how to avoid such a war, how to preserve freedom while seeking to avoid such a war, how to establish, how to create a military establishment that reduces the dangers of such a war, what arms control policies are compatible with this policy, how we handle crises, those are serious questions. To engage in, a, in an orgy of, of, of demonstrating how terrible uh, the casualties of a nuclear war are and translating into pictures the statistics that have been known for three decades, and then to have Mr. Sagan say it's even worse than this, uh, I would say, what are we to do about this? Uh, is it, are we supposed to make policy by scaring ourselves to death, or is somebody going to make some proposals of where we are supposed to go? And if people don't make that, then I do not believe we are making any contribution. That's my objection to this film. It took this most simple-minded problem that everybody will agree upon. There's nobody in this room who disagrees with the fact that this, this must not happen. It's how to avoid it that we should be discussing. Dr. Kissinger, you have brought us precisely to the issue that I think brings us all here together this evening. Uh, I think it can go without saying that there's no one in this room. Indeed, there is probably no sane person in the country who would recommend nuclear war or who would look at that movie and say that what is seen there is, is some prescription for any solution to any problem. We are here to try to answer the question of what if anything can be done. Mr. McNamara, you want to take a crack at that question? I think much can be done, Mr. Koppel, much that we're not doing. And I want to start by emphasizing, I'm not talking about the Reagan administration, I'm talking about several different administrations, but most of all, I'm talking about the American people. I do not believe the American people understand the world we live in. I do not believe they understand the full risk that we face. There are 40,000 nuclear warheads in the inventories of the U.S. and the Soviet Union today, with a destruction power roughly a million times that of the Hiroshima bomb. I don't know any arms expert, and I doubt if anyone in this room believes that in the next 10 to 15 years we can reduce that number by more than half. And we're still going to be living then in a world 15 years from now with 20,000 nuclear weapons. And I, frankly, I, I think that's very unlikely to get that low. But just assume that. What makes you think we'll be alive 15 years from now? Because, because in addition to stressing reduction in the numbers of weapons, we need to stress introducing stability in the forces to avoid temptation to either side to preempt. And most of all, we need to introduce steps to reduce the risk that those weapons will be used. And I don't want to take more of my, no, 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 than my time, but I'll be quite happy uh, during this program to outline a whole series of those. Well, things. in fact, you stopped short of where I thought you were going. Let us assume for a moment the, the desirable but probably the unthinkable, and that is that we could somehow agree to do away with all nuclear weapons. Let, we still live with the knowledge of, of how to make them. How does one well, live in a nuclear world, one which we will never be able to well, turn back? We live in a nuclear world by stressing that this is a plus-sum game that we're working on. There is a commonality of interest between the Soviets and the U.S. to avoid the use of these weapons. That's what that film shows. I totally disagree with those who say it's, it's a, a, a disservice to the nation to show the film. Not at all. It's stimulating discussion on exactly the issue we ought to be discussing. There is a million times the Hiroshima destruction power out there. We must ensure it not be used. It's equally in the interest of the Soviet Union not to use it. And therefore, there is a, a basis for coming to agreement. It's going to be very, very difficult. And while we're working on reducing the numbers, which the arms negotiations now in 
and Geneva are pointed to, we should pick up an idea that Henry Kissinger put forward. I put it forward, others have put it forward. It's not enough to reduce numbers. We must increase stability. As long as we have more warheads than they have launchers, they fear we may use those warheads to destroy their launchers and destroy their society. We must begin to introduce stability. Henry has suggested, I've suggested that we move to <coughs> reducing the ratio of warheads to launchers. This sounds technical. It's not. It simply means increasing the safety of both societies. If we both move that way, we're both better off. There are 15 different actions I could suggest to you, which, if taken today, some unilateral, by the way, we must be more daring, we must be more imaginative as a society, not just as a government, as a society, to reduce this risk. And we must negotiate, we must drag the Soviets into negotiating let me pick up a point that was made here a few moments ago and address it to you, General Scowcroft. I believe it was you, Mr. Buckley, who found optimism in Mr. Sagan's pessimism. If indeed we live in a world in which a nuclear exchange of, what, 100 megatons or more, Carl? Is that what we're talking about? If we live in a world in which an exchange of 100 <coughs> megatons or more means whether literally or almost literally the extinction of the human race, have we not reached a point at which any kind of nuclear exchange is unthinkable because of what it may portend? It may be unthinkable, but deterrence is a very ambiguous notion. Uh, it cannot be demonstrated unless it fails, in which case you knew it was not there. Otherwise, it cannot be demonstrated. We have probably very different ideas about deterrence than does the Soviet Union. Uh, I think we tend to think that nuclear weapons have done away with war as an instrument of national policy, that it is insane, that uh, uh, the mere existence of nuclear weapons mean that nuclear war cannot happen, as you suggest. Well, forgive me, there are, there are something like 42, 43, or maybe 44 wars going on in the world right now, so clearly it hasn't done away with war. Are you talking about nuclear war? war? I'm talking about a U.S.-Soviet nuclear exchange, All right. like the movie. The Soviet Union, however, both as a result of its history of repeated invasion and the extent to which ideology still motivates its belief that it is surrounded by hostile states, probably wants nuclear war no more than does the United States, but I think realistically anticipates that it could happen. And if it could happen, then they must do their best to prepare for it. And I think it is that that is the central, central issue of deterrence, and that is we must have a military posture which the Soviets, whatever they think about deterrence, whatever they think about the nature of nuclear weapons, can never imagine that resort to them makes sense. I'm when not sure you, that's clear at this point. Well, when you talk about preparation for it, I assume you mean, among other things, their evacuation procedures, their civil defense program, and things like that. If I understand Carl Sagan and his colleagues, and they seem to be in total agreement with Soviet scientists, all of that is so academic as to be totally pointless. If indeed we're going to have a world in which life itself is essentially extinguished, what difference does it make whether it's extinguished six feet underground or extinguished on the surface? Because I don't think fundamentally we're talking about deliberate decision to launch nuclear war. We're talking about behavior in a crisis where each side is estimating both the posture and the will of the other side, in which case miscalculations can make all the difference between peace and war. And it is in that guise that we must ensure that the Soviet Union can never miscalculate. Before we slide too far into the technical, Elie Wiesel, we deliberately invited you here so that you would bring a humanistic touch to what otherwise threatens to become either a very technical or a, or a, a very theoretical kind of discussion. Is there anything that the individual man can do anymore? Is there any point in even discussing that, or is it out of his and her hands? Not being a nuclear specialist in any way, I'm scared. I'm scared because I know that what is imaginable can happen. I know that the impossible is possible. I've seen the film, and while I was watching it, I had a strange feeling.
that I had seen it before, except once upon a time it happened to my people, and now it happened to all people. And suddenly I said to myself, maybe the whole world, strangely, has turned Jewish. Everybody lives now facing the unknown. We are all, in a way, helpless. We are talking about nuclear arms, about the bomb with a capital B, a kind of divinity in itself, unless uh, those who know militarily what it means, we uh, readers, writers, people, we don't know what it all means. When I hear about thousand bombs, megatons, I don't have that kind of imagination. To me it's an abstraction. But to me all this means is that the human species may come to an end. That millions of children may die simply because one person somewhere, and I am not so much afraid of the big powers, I'm afraid of the small nations. If not now, maybe 10 years from now, or 20 or 50, a Khomeini will get hold of nuclear weapons. He won't hesitate, he will not have a discussion such as the one, the one as we have here, and it's fear. Elie Wiesel, you know better than most that during the 1930s in Europe, especially in England. There were discussions not dissimilar from this discussion in which people with the best of motives spoke about pacifism, the need not to go to war, the, the, the horror of war, and some historians feel, indeed I would suggest most historians feel, that it was that very sense that brought about precisely what everyone was trying to avoid. I think what Dr. Kissinger was talking about before is precisely that, the danger that in being human about what we've just seen, we may become not only impractical but unwise. Would you like well, to respond I, I to that agree. notion? No, I, I, I agree with you, and I agree with Dr. Kissinger on that. It's true that uh, pacifism in the absolute sense would be dangerous. We cannot yield our world to dictatorship. We cannot yield our Western society, our democracy, to a totalitarian regime that would have alone, exclusively, a nuclear superiority. It would be foolish. On the other hand, I also know that if we have thousands and more thousands and more thousands of weapons, one day they will explode. Hence my ambivalence, meaning hence my fear. I do not see realistically a way out. I don't know what could be done. Dr. Kissinger, you've been writing about dealing with this notion, as you pointed out a few moments ago, for some 30 years. Why do we need all these weapons, which, as, as Churchill once pointed out, are sufficient now only to make the rubble bounce? Uh, on the, from the point of view of strategic doctrine, of, of, or of military strategy, I have been writing for 30 years that these are weapons in search of a doctrine. Uh, so I do not want to defend any particular level of, fo of, uh, of forces. Uh, the fact, however, is, as uh, Bob McNamara pointed out, we have 40,000 now. Uh, if we cut them in half in 10 years, it would be a miraculous achievement. Uh, the exact same problem we are discussing tonight will exist at the level of 20,000. And that problem is how do we avoid their use that has a component of, uh, of relationship among the superpowers and among the nuclear powers. It requires us to analyze the design of our forces and to design them in such a manner that there is a minimum incentive for first strike by either side it requires that we analyze what is likely to cause crisis, and it requires that we do not scare ourselves to death. Because if the Soviet Union gets the idea that the United States is, has morally disarmed itself and psychologically disarmed itself, then the precise consequences we are describing here will happen. Uh, our problem is to avoid unilateral disarmament and at the same time to develop a policy which 
eliminates the uh, danger of nuclear war. This is, this is the challenge we face. And uh, we have been, we've been going back and forth between extremes of intransigence and extremes of, uh, uh, of uh, conciliation. And if we, don't, if we do not focus on, on some of the problems that Bob McNamara mentioned, uh, how we design forces that make for stability, how we communicate over an extended period of time, and what political crisis we must seek to avoid and how to handle them in time, then things are going to slide. But the relationship that is being established around this uh, table between the numbers of weapons and the probability of war is, in my view, not true. Uh, the kind of war shown in this film is most likely at the lowest numbers of, uh, of weapons uh, and has, in fact, been advocated at the uh, if, lowest numbers of weapons. If you can, Dr. Kissinger, explain that briefly. Why? Well, the theory, there was a theory at one time uh, that was, and that is still used by many, uh, by many groups, which is that if you can uh, kill a certain number of people and if you can destroy a limited number of cities, what, what do you need more nuclear weapons for? And then there have been all sorts of calculations made, 200, 300, 400. At any rate, the point is that these weapons have then been advertised as a means of slaughtering <coughs> civilians. This creates exactly the dilemma we now face. Any statesman, I think Bob will, will forgive me if I tell him a personal encounter we had. When I became security advisor, I uh, saw for the first time what our plans were. And I called up Bob as the last Secretary of Defense, or at any rate, the one I knew best. I asked him to come to the White House. And I first asked him whether he thought these figures were accurate. And then I asked him how he was going to handle that issue if he ever had to be asked by the President on what to recommend. So this, this, issue has been, this issue has been with us, and it will face, and it will face, every, it will face every administration uh, of whatever party. We can't eliminate these weapons completely in a foreseeable time. Uh, we should not have a strategy that is designed to maximize casualties because then if anything goes wrong, we will have Carl Sagan's world. And yet we are assaulted, anyone who seeks that course, on the one side by military technologists who think nuclear weapons are just another kind of weapon, and then by pacifist groups who believe that unless you paint the most horrible picture of nuclear war, it will happen, and you participate in bringing it about. This is why it's been so hard to get a, uh, a, the sort of thing that uh, Bob McNamara is talking about. All right, we're going to have to take a break in just a couple of minutes. Mr. Buckley, go ahead. I may have to cut you off in mid-sentence, though. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I'd like to focus on this business of stabilization because I think we have moved away from stabilization. There's a line in this movie, they're hearing all this bad news about all the threats that are happening, the Germans are moving and the Russians are moving, and then the girl says, uh, well, we did have a crisis in 1962, and we overcame that, didn't we? There isn't anybody there who says yes, and we also had a considerable deterrent quality in 1962, which was unambiguous. Question, are we moving towards an ambiguity in our deterrent forces? In the last four years, the German Social Democratic Party has turned right around. I would ask Mr. McNamara, is that a sign of stabilization or precisely the contrary? But it's by seeing this kind of thing, which, by the way, they all saw before they took that vote last week. Let me before, just... Before, no, before, and I, I promise I'll come right back to you so you have an opportunity to answer that question. But before we do that, uh, I need to say this. As we are coming up on the hour, that this is a special edition of ABC News Viewpoint. I'm Ted Kopp. <coughs> now then. Mr. McNamara, pick it up, please. First, we have a stable deterrent today. We do a great disservice to our nation when we say otherwise. 
and we will have a stable deterrent tomorrow if we act intelligently. I have absolutely no question in my mind about it. But I want to go back to the two conditions that we are facing, and they're not going to change. I was in Berlin today. I had lunch in Berlin. I was at the wall today. We didn't build the wall. The wall was built 22 years ago by the Soviets to hold their people in. They retain it today for exactly the same reason. I'm not arguing whether it's wise or unwise for them to do it. It's a symbol of the tension that exists. Events possibly beyond their control or ours may cause these miscalculations that were discussed a moment ago. That's one set of facts. The other set of facts is the 40,000 nuclear warheads that Henry and I agree are unlikely to be cut by more than 50% in the next 10, 15 years. We're going to live for decades in a world of tension and with tens of thousands of warheads, a few hundred of which can cause, pardon me, Mr. Let, 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 let me, decades. may I finish, <clears throat> that can cause nuclear winter or destroy civilization. We must learn how to avoid their use. Nobody that I have ever talked to knows how to stop a nuclear war once it started. Therefore, God's sakes, don't ever start one. That's the first point. All right. Uh, let me let Mr. Sagan respond to that, then General Scowcroft, and then, folks, you may as well get ready with your questions because we're going to start involving you with all of the panel. Mr. Sagan. Let me, let me try to make uh, three quick points coming out of the previous discussion. First of all, the, there is a kind of threshold. It's fuzzy, but it's somewhere around 1,000 strategic weapons at which the nuclear winter could be triggered. If that's the case, it seems to me that the only prudent policy is to get well below that threshold so that no concatenation of uh, computer failure and communications malfunctions and madness in high office could kill everybody on the planet. That seems to me elementary planetary hygiene as well as elementary patriotism. You don't want to have a circumstance in which we can end the human endeavor. Now, I think that with 18,000 strategic warheads in the world, we have 18 times at least more weapons than are needed to trigger this catastrophe. If you were well below 1,000 warheads, you would still have an adequate strategic deterrence, and I believe just as slavery was once in the world and people considered it impossible to change and it was everywhere well now we have a world in which there's virtually no chattel slavery conventional expectations about what is inevitable can be changed if there's political will and i think that the existence of this catastrophe can provide a political will now just one more thing we heard from secretary schultz in answer to your question ted that uh, it wasn't true that the reagan administration was building up uh, weapons that in fact they had reduced weapons and he mentioned a figure of a thousand in Europe now those thousand weapons in Europe are tactical weapons not strategic weapons they are largely obsolete weapons and they are forward based weapons which means that they are vulnerable to capture in case of an attack now what the administration is really doing according to the Congressional Budget Office is increasing the inventory of strategic warheads from 9,000 in the United States to 14,000. We are going in the wrong direction. Carl, forgive me. Let us leave it in those general terms, because I must confess, statistics leave my mind reeling, and I suspect everybody else is too. General Scowcroft, you want to respond to the general thrust of what Dr. Sagan was saying? Yes. There are two basic truths. We are not going to disinvent nuclear weapons, as, as Henry said. The knowledge, and as Bob said, the knowledge of them there Regardless of the number, the knowledge is there. In some respects, the lower the numbers, the more unstable the situation and the more the encouragement for other powers to acquire nuclear weapons. That's the second time that's been said now. Dr. Kissinger said it a moment ago. Explain it one more time. Why is less more in this case? Because if each side, if the Soviet Union, the United States, has only 1,000 weapons or, or each only 500, that encourages other powers to become major nuclear powers in a way that they can do because the numbers are relatively small. Well, in that case, what you're, what you're sketching out is a world in which, by definition, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union can ever afford to fall below a certain excessive level. I think for the short-term future, that may be true. I think the the two truths are that we are in a nuclear age, and secondly, we do have a fundamental antagonism with the Soviet Union, which we may be able to ameliorate, but 
which for the foreseeable future is not going to end. Now, the question is, what do we do about it? And I agree with Bob McNamara that we are not going to get rid of nuclear weapons. The important thing is, as the uh, President's Commission on Strategic Forces underlined, is to improve the stability, to integrate our weapon systems programs and our arms control to reduce the chances that in a crisis, either side will resort to nuclear weapons, feeling it can gain an advantage. All right, and gentlemen, that can be done. I have a hundred questions buzzing in my mind, but I suspect that there are at least... All right, and gentlemen, that can be done. I have a hundred questions buzzing in my mind, but I suspect that there are at least 200 people out there. Uh, the gentleman over here in about the third row, go ahead, sir, it's your question. Secretary Schultz has said tonight that there's a lot more to do. Mr. Mag McNamara said tonight that we have to increase stability while at the same time being much more imaginative. Secretary, uh, Mr. Kissinger said that we need a policy that will one day eliminate the need for, for, for these type of weapons. I'll tell you what, help me out so that you don't set an example here that I don't want anyone else to follow. Don't tell us what we have already heard. Ask your question, please. Okay, the question is, is it not possible to somehow develop a technological end run uh, to find a solution that might be a space-based defense system, uh, a system that would render nuclear weapons obsolete. I'd like for the panelists to comment on this. All right, we're hearing from the, the High Frontier School of Thought, right? That would be correct. All right, who would like to pick it up? Dr. Kissinger, High Frontier? Uh, I, uh, I don't know enough about the, uh, the space technology uh, uh, to have a judgment. Uh, on whether it is technically possible to do this. Uh, the, debate, the debate on the nuclear issue has taken the paradoxical form that whenever a defense system has been proposed, it has been opposed by many of the groups that are <coughs> dedicated to disarmament because they're afraid that anything that reduces the impact of a nuclear war also increases the willingness to engage in it. And therefore, there has been a tendency to deprecate any uh, possible defense systems. I don't particularly, uh, I haven't studied, or I don't know anything about the, uh, whether the space system, I do not believe, how, uh, however, it's a general proposition, that there is one reliable technological means uh, on the basis of which you can say that now the danger of nuclear war has been uh, eliminated. Uh, on the other hand, I also do not like this undifferentiated discussion of all nuclear wars taking Carl Sagan's uh, 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 form. And uh, what, what are you saying with that last point? Are you suggesting What I'm that saying with this point is I, I believe if it is true that we live in a world in which we are doomed to have nuclear weapons, and if it is true that someday there could be an accident, then it is also true that together with all the measures that have been discussed, we have a moral and political obligation to, to think of procedures, strategies and methods to keep the war from mindlessly escalating into the sort of thing that we have seen on television here, and not to talk ourselves into the frame of mind that the first time a nuclear weapon is used, it must end with the destruction of hundreds of millions of people and a nuclear window. Carl Sagan, pick up, if you will, on A, the question that was asked, but B, also the point that Dr. Kissinger yes, made, namely you. that that defensive systems, and for example, at one point we were in the process of building an anti-ballistic missile system in this country, that defensive systems are destabilizing because they may lull the side that has it into a sense of security that would permit that side to then launch nuclear weapons on the other side. Well, on the space-based uh, systems, for them to have any adequacy to stop a significant strike, they have to have a technology which does not exist today, which the best experts in the field say cannot exist, in any case something which would cost enormous amounts of money that would have to be deployed on an absolutely unprecedented scale and which is vulnerable to the simplest kinds of countermeasures. 
So my sense is that uh, the uh, ballistic missile defense system is being talked about, and there are a variety of them, and obviously we don't want to get into the details, is dangerous, A, because it lulls us into thinking that we can get away from this problem without the kinds of confidence building and stabilizations that Dr. Kissinger and Secretary McNamara have talked about. All right, let's, uh, let's go but to questions. I, the, uh, the, uh, the lady in about the fifth row back. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, what are we to do 20 to 25 years from now when the superpowers no longer have uh, the decision-making power about whether nuclear war will or will not occur? And this could be a small-scale nuclear war as opposed to uh, uh, the type of war that, that we've seen in the movie where, you know, complete devastation everywhere. What about the point that Mr. Wiesel uh, raised earlier about a Khomeini or a Gaddafi? Uh, having that capability. Mr. McNamara, do you want to pick up on that? Well, I, I would say several things. First, <clears throat> we need to maintain and tighten our non-proliferation policy. We have allowed it to become weak, and we, by that means, have contributed to the problem this lady is pointing to. Secondly, we need to establish procedures that will ensure that our nuclear forces are not triggered by a terrorist launch of a weapon or by an accident, uh, mechanical or, or human failure. And we need to ensure that the Soviets are following the same procedures. These are the kinds of actions that we need to take in our common interest to avoid launch against terrorists, thinking we're launching against a Soviet attack, or launch in the event of mechanical or human failure. Insofar. And one of those procedures that we ought to take unilaterally and then we ought to try to persuade them to adopt as well is to state publicly, we will never, never, never launch on warning. We have not yet said that, nor right. have they. You have, you have just raised, I'm afraid, uh, an issue of such controversy that I don't think I can just let it go by. Launch on warning is the notion that if anyone were to fire any missiles in our direction, we would not wait for them to land but the president would give the command that our land-based nuclear missiles, our ICBMs, it's, it's the old use them or lose them notion, right? Yes. And, and is that in point, well, I'm not even sure if you can discuss it, is, is that our policy? We have not said it is not our policy, and the Secretary of the Air Force, within the past few weeks in California, has stated that the administration is unwilling to state it's not our policy, and the Soviets, within the past several weeks, have, in their press, indicated that the Pershing missile deployment to Europe is likely to trigger their launch on warning. All right, but now, I that... think we're both insane if we ever launch on warning, All right, because but the that... warnings may be false, is that not... as they have been in the past. Is that not another one of the paradoxes that seem to dot this nuclear minefield, unless we maintain that level of doubt? in our adversaries' minds that it might happen, they might be tempted no, to try No, absolutely it? not. Because our forces are invulnerable and so are theirs. There's absolutely no reason for the Soviets to launch on warning and there's absolutely no reason for, for us to launch on Anybody warning. Anybody disagree with that? Uh, yes. I actually, yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I do not believe we should launch on warning. Uh, I, don't, I don't know any administration that would have launched uh, on warning. Uh, and I doubt that this administration then we should uh, say so. would launch on warning. Now, the, the question is, uh, does the concept of launching on warning make a nuclear war uh, more likely? Uh, uh, the, the argument for not saying what we are doing and, and will be doing uh, is that if you assert it, it makes the calculations of a potential attacker somewhat simpler, because he can then determine exactly what is going, uh, or at least he can try to turn it into a mathematical problem. Uh, if you don't say it, uh, there is an element of doubt. But I want to make clear, I think neither side can possibly gear its procedures to uh, to launch a gun warning, uh, I, I think it's it's from a procedural point uh, technically next to impossible, and uh, I think it would be a a highly uh, 
destabilizing cause, so I agree with the policy. The question is whether there's a great advantage in saying it. This, uh, this, I'm not so... Dr. Kissinger, here's where I think you're incorrect. What we mustn't lose sight of is the fact that we want to deter. Uh, now, uh, President Carter came out and recommended a mobile uh, missile, the idea being to uh, shield us from that uh, window of vulnerability of our fixed uh, silos, which can be wiped out, giving the enemy uh, a leverage over, uh, over us by threatening to take out our, our cities. Now, Congress turned that down. In turning that down, we then headed towards MX. But the point is, we have got to head in such a direction as to guarantee our survival of a first strike. And if, right. if, if launch on warning is what we are reduced to as a result of our failure to, uh, uh, to allow a proliferation of small weapons, then indeed that's certainly better uh, if indeed it succeeds in deterring. Gentlemen, there's, a, there's an awful lot that every one of these questions and all of your answers provokes, but as you can see, we have a great many questions. The gentleman in the in about the fifth row back, yes, sir, go ahead. You. Oh, you're, there you go. As an educator, I find that young people are increasingly aware of the threat of nuclear war and are very cynical and despairing about their future. My question to any of the panelists is, how do you think this next generation should be educated about these issues so that they can engage in planning for their own future with a sense of hope. Elie Wiesel, why don't you pick up on that? <coughs> the key word is education, and I happen to believe that that is the only way for us to save mankind, is through education. It's not weapons. We are talking here about changing weapons, improving weapons. Why not improve human nature, if it is possible at all, to speak about it? Uh, I too, I, I'm in, in touch with young students. My students are, are, are scared when they talk about the nuclear issue. They are worried, so am I. Because I must tell you, I'm a little bit um, taken aback. We are already fighting the nuclear war around this table. We already have speaking about the first strike, about uh, warning, about bombing. How can we even talk about it? I would like to educate <coughs> Um, our society, our young people especially, to uh, make sure that it won't happen. How it can we, uh, forgive me, but how can we not talk about it? Well, that is really the problem. If we talk, it's bound to happen. If we don't, it's bound to happen again. Go ahead, Mr. Barkley. <laughs> No, I think, I think that we do have to talk about it, and uh, Dr. Kissinger, 25 years ago, got hell for consenting to talk about it, so did Herman Kahn. The fact of the matter is that uh, here we are talking about all the tensions we're going to be living on uh, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Well, the implied uh, assumption is that we're going to be alive 15, 20 years from now. That's pretty good news, isn't it? Yeah. We, we began with a monopoly of atom, uh, atom bombs. We offered to give them to the United Nations. When we had a monopoly, we dropped one on Japan. If Japan had had one, we wouldn't have dropped one on Japan. So the, I see nothing that has changed involving that essential stability. And uh, although all of us wish this nightmare would go away, in point of fact, it's probably not going to, unless somebody does a lobotomy on the men in the Kremlin. Well, and nobody suggested doing that. F Fifteen years may be pretty good news to men of your generation and mine. I suspect that some of our children might regard that as a rather limited lifespan. He didn't say there was going to be a war in 15 years. Go ahead, go ahead John. <laughs> I think, you know, we're not talking about nuclear war. We're talking about the steps necessary to deter, to prevent a nuclear war. And to me, that's, a, sim that's a, a vast difference. And faced with the central dilemma of our times, that is nuclear weapons and U.S.-Soviet antagonism, we have to sort a way through it. And the first thing I would tell young people is that there is no simple nostrum no simple solution that if we could just get rid of inept or malevolent government, would be out there for us to grab to solve our problem. It All right, isn't let's, there. let's go ahead, sir. The, uh, the gentleman on the aisle with his left hand up. Thank you. Uh, for Professor Sagan, please, 75% of the American public supports the nuclear weapons freeze with the Soviet Union. Yet we haven't heard that mentioned this evening. I'm wondering if, as an alternative 
to prevent nuclear war, people opposing the MX missile, the Trident 2 missile, the Pershing, the Cruz, is that not a viable alternative for people to rally around as, a, as an alternative to what the Reagan administration is planning in the next, not 10 years, for the next two or three years? But wouldn't everything that we saw tonight be possible if there was a free... Well, your question will come uh, in a minute. Why don't I, if I could get Professor Sagan... Uh, my opinion is that uh, the freeze, which uh, you quite properly point out, is supported according to opinion polls and votes by the majority of the American people, I think it would be an excellent first step. It tends to prevent the introduction of further destabilizing modernization, and it would almost certainly be followed, as in the Kennedy-Hatfield resolution, by an agreement on a annual percentage drop in nuclear weapons. And if that's at the 5 to 10 percent a year level, which is what it's talked about, that would get us a long step up on getting to this threshold I talked about. If I can just say one other thing about this. We, in this discussion, there's been a, a sense that you can't change things, that, that uh, getting down even by a factor of two in decades uh, is the most you could possibly hope for. I'd like to uh, read a quick quotation from, uh, from General Douglas MacArthur. He said, the masses of the world are far ahead of their leaders in this subject. I believe it is the massed opposition of the rank and file against war that offers the greatest possible hope that there shall be no more war. And then Dwight Eisenhower said something very similar. He said, people in the long run are going to do more to promote peace than our governments. Indeed, I think that people want peace so much that one of these days governments had better get out of their way and let them have it. Let's talk for a moment about nuclear freeze, just for a moment. Uh, Mr. McNamara. Uh, the question I want to raise is there, is there is implied in every discussion of nuclear freeze the suggestion that it could happen, if not overnight, then certainly within a very short period of time. Do you accept that? Well, I, I think a freeze could happen uh, quickly, but I don't believe it gets at the heart of the problem we're talking about. It isn't a freeze we need. It's a substantial reduction. It's an increase in stability. It's a reduction in the risk of use and the freeze fails to address those issues. The freeze movement has played, from my point of view, a very <clears throat> positive role in our society. It has drawn the attention of political leaders, uh, religious leaders, and other leaders of our country to this problem, and that's been very positive. But it does not go nearly far enough in dealing with the problem we're talking about. Dr. Kissinger, some thoughts on the freeze? I, <clears throat> I think that that the freeze uh, will prevent uh, many of the measures uh, that we've been talking about. It would prevent, for example, going from the MIRV missile to the single warhead missile. It might prevent uh, uh, the, uh, the changes in the, many, several other changes in the direction of, st of stability. Uh, I was involved in, an, in uh, in fact, I conducted the negotiations for SALT-1, which were a freeze of uh, certain categories of weapons, and it leads you into an endless debate of what is modernization and what is a new weapon, what is a modernization of an old weapon. So the freeze by itself is, uh, uh, is in my view, not a solution uh, to the problem. Uh, the problem is uh, the solution in the military field is to develop uh, uh, military doctrines that conduce to stability. And there's a second point that has not been mentioned this evening at all. We are talking as if nuclear weapons cause wars. What will cause wars is political tensions and, uh, and crises and uncontrolled ambitions. And uh, unless one is willing to face that fact, and unless one is willing to do something about it, uh, uh, if tensions multiply in the world, sooner or later there'll be a war, not necessarily a nuclear war. And any war increases the danger in which we are involved, and maybe the Soviets are involved, increases the danger of nuclear war. And there has to be a linkage, unfashionable as this word is, between the military strategies of the countries and their political conduct. And if that cannot be established, uh, then sooner or later it is going to be the political instability that is going to drive us into war, not the weapons by themselves. All right, let's see if we can get to the gentleman way in the back there with your left hand up. Go ahead. 
we, I'm not necessarily afraid of the man in the White House or us here and building on what Mr. Kissinger said. How do we convey, how do we get to the men in the Kremlin to say we want to do something? What can we do about them? General Sotros? I think the men in the Kremlin respond to strength. And by and large, they take gestures of goodwill designed by us to indicate we bear them no ill will as signs of weakness rather than in the sense in which they are presented. I think it is possible to negotiate with the Soviet Union. It is not possible to negotiate them out of something they think they can get for free. And I think that is the central reason why we have to continue a vigorous arms program to convince the Soviets that there is no easy way for them to gain or to maintain an advantage over the United States. If they realize that, I think it is possible to negotiate serious arms control negotiations with them. Elie Wiesel, I, I mentioned before, the, 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 the whole discussion of nuclear issues is filled with paradoxes. Put your fine philosopher's mind to, to the last paradox that we just heard. You cannot indicate goodwill by showing weakness. You have to show strength, and then you can show the goodwill, and then there will be a response. But it's always a building upon a building upon a building. Well, I am not against paradoxes, as you know, but then I am not a political scientist, which is my, my privilege. But on the other hand, I am optimistic with regard to Russia in a strange way. Not because of the strength that you invoke, but because of the people in Russia. I have the feeling that what is happening here in the Western society, meaning there is an increasing awareness about the nuclear menace, I think it is happening, it is beginning to happen in the Russian society as well. The human rights movement in Russia, headed by Sakharov, who is a great hero and a great man, the human rights movement is an anti-nuclear movement in Russia. It, but it may take a few years, but the young people in Russia, I'm convinced of that, will join, in a way, will join hands with us. Uh, we have seen it, for instance, in, in, in the case of Soviet Jewry, that the young people in the thousands, and I have seen them myself, in the thousands, in the early 60s already, came out and they dared to defy the Soviet regime, openly. <coughs> I'm convinced that sooner or later they will move, Jews and non-Jews, and all the dissidents in Russia will move into the anti-nuclear field, meaning they will try to, to persuade their leaders with all the risks involved, that it is impossible to think about a nuclear war. Mr. Berkeley, do you... Uh, so, so, well, go ahead, Mr. McNamara. No, I, I want to come back just one second to the gentleman that asked about the youth. This is a very important question. What can we tell our young people today about this world we're moving into? I say we should tell them there's hope. We should have confidence. We should not create myths of our weakness. In the 1960s, the presidential campaign was fought on the myth, as it turned out later, of a missile gap. Recently, we've had the myth, and it is a myth, of a window of vulnerability. And it was General Scowcroft's commission that tore aside that myth and destroyed it. We consistently understate and underrate our own strength in the world. We are a democratic country. That brings us strength. We are technologically advanced. We have productivity far superior in agriculture and industry and arms to the Soviets. We just saw yesterday, or day before yesterday, I read in Europe that the CIA is now saying that the Soviets have not been increasing their defense expenditures as much as we said they were. We should tell our young people to be confident, confident of our strengths and deal with the Soviets from a position of confidence. On that, faint, on that, excuse me, on that faint glimmer of optimism, let me just uh, give a cautionary note to our affiliates down the line. Uh, we are going to go a little bit longer, and I think you can see why there's no need to explain any further. Yes, ma'am, on the aisle. Okay, um, to address the previous point, how can we talk about a nuclear freeze at this point in time when Sahadov is well aware, who is well aware of the serious consequences of a nuclear confrontation, <laughs> states that in order to prevent a nuclear war and to get the Soviets to seriously negotiate, we must first achieve nuclear parity with the current deployment of missiles in Europe, and secondly, that we must reach a position of strength from which meaningful reductions can be made. According to Dr. Sahadov, it is only by attaining... I'll tell you what, Dr. Dr. Sahadov, I'm sure, has a lot of fascinating things to say, but 
but boil it down to a brief question, if you would. Okay. Therefore, to push, it, push for nuclear freeze this time would be detrimental for the safety and security of the free world. Is, would it not? Carl Sagan? Imagine a room awash in gasoline. And there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches. The other has 7,000 matches. Each of them is concerned about who's ahead, who's stronger. Well, that's the kind of situation we are actually in. The amount of weapons that are available to the United States and the Soviet Union are so bloated, so grossly in excess of what's needed to dissuade the other, that if it weren't so tragic, it would be laughable. What is necessary is to reduce the matches and to clean up the gasoline. I have great respect for Carl Sagan's judgment, but it is true that Andrei Sakharov himself suggested that the United States probably had to, to deploy the MX missile in order to bring the Soviets to the bargaining table. All right, folks, uh, before we even start with a smattering of applause, we had a little compact before. We're going to keep it. No signs of approval or disapproval. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, the, uh, think, the lady in the back. I don't think Dr. Sagan should uh, be Mr. allowed Barclay, to shake his head. Well, uh, let, let, let Dr. Sagan shake, shake his head, and you can shake yours, and let's get on to the next question, please. <laughs> Many of the panelists have been emphasizing that what the real objective is is the pursuit of stability in the world. Uh, Secretary McNamara, Mr. Kissinger both emphasized this. I have to ask, in light of that, and if we want to redu reduce the probability of a conventional war escalating into a nuclear war, is it uh, time for us to question our policies in the Middle East and our invasion of Grenada, our plans for invasion of Central America? Isn't, isn't that the type of situation that could, in fact, emerge and erupt into a nuclear war? Mr. Buckley? Well, uh, theoretically, anything could result in a nuclear war if the Soviet Union thought it could win it. <clears throat> but I think that uh, we prove that we are stronger than Grenada, and that uh, uh, in, in, in flexing our muscles there, uh, we probably convinced the Soviet Union not that it would be profitable to provoke us with a nuclear war, but that they had better watch out before they start uh, trying to gobble up the Caribbean. So I, th I think on, on the whole, our venture in Grenada was definitely a venture towards a, a stability. And I wouldn't be surprised if when he was Secretary of Defense, Mr. McNamara had an invasion of Grenada as a contingency operation. Did you? No. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next question. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd like to return to a, an affirmative approach to some of these problems. Secretary Kissinger mentioned the need for new institutions with which to maintain stability. At this time, thousands of Americans have joined together to work for the establishment of a National Peace Academy, which would uh, focus and concentrate study and research in the field of peacemaking and conflict resolution. My question to the panel is, would it not be a, a method of trying to prevent what we saw tonight by de devo devoting some of our resources to the field, uh, to study and research in this field? Isn't it, and isn't it time that we got on with it? Dr. Kissinger, are we in, in suggesting a peace academy and suggesting that we devote our resources to that? Are we being naive or is that in fact the, the reality with which we have to come to grips? No, I think that the problem of, uh, of peace uh, requires careful thought and study. I am uneasy about the concept of a peace academy uh, because I do not believe you can segregate the notion of peace and the no, uh, from the notion from the general conduct of international uh, affairs. Uh, it used to be said uh, 25 years ago, in fact I said it myself at the time, that if we could only devote more resources to the study of arms control uh, we would make great breakthroughs in thinking about arms control. In fact, almost all of the breakthroughs that were made in the thinking on arms control happened before a lot of resources were devoted to its study because I had an uneasy feeling the same papers were written over and over again uh, as research funds uh, uh, became, uh, became available. Uh, I, I don't like the idea that peace is something abstract and that there's a group of peace lovers and a group of warmongers. Uh, I, I think we have to study the whole context of international relations 
for the purpose of bringing about peace, stability, progress towards peace and stability. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, so I, it isn't something I would publicly oppose or would have taken a position on if you hadn't raised the question at right. this, at this uh, program, and I wouldn't feel deprived if... Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you fair warning. We're coming down to roughly our last 10 minutes, so let's see if we can make the questions crisp and the answers equally crisp. Yes, sir, it's your question. Yes, I'd like to direct my questions to both uh, Mr. Scowcroft and Mr. Kissinger. Uh, if, in fact, what we're trying to do now is move away from single warhead, I, move away from MIRVED ICBMs towards single warhead ICBMs, why are we then moving forward with the 10 warhead MIRVED MX missile? General Scowcroft? Uh, I think <clears throat> because uh, it's essential to deploy the MX in order to get from here to there. The single warhead missile is a long ways away. The Soviets at the present time have an advantage in land-based ICBMs. You can argue about the significance of that, but in fact it does exist. There's no reason they should give up that advantage without without some incentive to do so. And last but not least, we've now had four presidents who have said that the MX missile is important, if not vital, to our national security. Now, to get back to this idea of, of deterrence and the will aspect of deterrence, uh, to go back on that uh, when there'd been no change in the circumstances, it seems to me would be, would be very detrimental. But uh, the small single warhead missile can best survive in an arms control environment which the MX should help preserve. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Warner, I'm not going to call on you for the very reason that your senatorial rank gives you a chance to talk to these gentlemen all the time. The lady over there on the aisle. You've talked a lot, Mr. Sagan, about a nuclear freeze. How can you talk about a nuclear freeze when we're dealing with people who would kill civilians on, a, on an airliner, who would use chemical weapons against women and children along with soldiers, and people who have never held up to many treaties that we made with them? How can we trust the Soviet Union when we're talking about arms control and a nuclear freeze? Without uh, debating the, whether what you said is factually right or not, which could be interesting but maybe too time-consuming, let me merely quote Averill Harriman, uh, who uh, said in this context that the only thing you can trust the Russians to do is to act in their own interest. And it is very clear that it is in their interest, as it is in our interest, to first freeze and then make a very steep decline in the total number of warheads in the world. What's more, we do have to trust and we can trust our own technology because the ability of the United States through reconnaissance satellites and other national technical means to verify a freeze and a major reduction is very clear. All right, let's move on to the next question. The uh, gentleman with his right hand up, go ahead. I'd like for the panel to react to a key point that I think that they haven't reacted to thus far, and that is, how do you accomplish a verifiable reduction in nuclear arms? Mr. Buckley, you want to take a crack at that? <clears throat> that's a, <clears throat> that's a technical, technical question I don't have uh, the answer to. All right, it then, is widely, uh, it's, wi it's widely alleged that they're violating SALT-1 right now. Maybe Dr. Kissinger can tell us whether that's true or not with that radar installation they have in Siberia. Well, rather than, rather than, than isolating on that point, is it in fact, Dr. Kissinger, possible to independently verify that the Soviets are keeping to agreements that they make? And to address the point that was raised just a moment ago, do we do it on the basis of trust ever? We shouldn't do it on the, we should not do it on the basis of trust during the period that I had access to, uh, to that kind of intelligence information, I did not believe that they were violating uh, SALT-1. There was one case of a marginal nature which was stopped uh, uh, when we called it to their attention, but uh, uh, on that particular issue of the radar station, if that is as described, I would, add, I would consider that a violation. All right, we're down to our last couple of questions. The lady in the front row. 
Secretary McNamara, you said that you had a list of about 18 things that the United States could do, and you mentioned uh, no launch on warning. You've written about no first use, and I wonder if you would please tell us what some of the other things are, both multilateral and unilateral, that the United States and the Soviet Union could do. Yes, yeah, so but, only, but only the top three. three. Thank you. Three, yes. because of limited, I'd be happy to tell you later the other 15. But, but first, we should reduce the number of warheads in Europe far more than we've agreed to so far. There are roughly 6,000 warheads there. They're obsolete, they're vulnerable, they're dangerous, they're useless. We could cut them in half tomorrow and be ahead. Secondly, we should withdraw of the remaining half those that are in the forward areas of Germany. They would be overrun in the early hours of a conflict. There would be a use them or lose them uh, uh, tension. And the great danger is they'd be used and start the conflagration we'd all want to stop. Thirdly, we could uh, engage the Soviets into much more productive negotiations of how to stabilize our respective forces beyond freezing or reducing the numbers. This is perhaps the most important single thing we could do to, to, uh, to avoid uh, unintended use of these weapons. Mr. McNamara, uh, allow me to consider that your statement of summation, and I'm going to let the other five panelists give us their closing thoughts because we are quite literally right. down to our last couple of minutes. General Scowcroft? I think the key issues are how we sort our way through what is a very dangerous period. I do agree, as Mr. McNamara said, that in the long term we have every reason for hope. The resources available to the West are so out of proportion to those available to the Soviet Union that if we can survive the next decade, next 10, 15 years, uh, I think we will be in good shape. All right, I'm going to place a very high premium on brevity, Dr. Sagan. Uh, I think that uh, this can be done. We can get out of this trap that we and the Soviets have jointly set for ourselves and our civilization and our species. But the way to cut nuclear weapons is to cut nuclear weapons. Dr. Kissinger. I think we must have uh, confidence in ourselves. And uh, we can solve both the uh, arms control problem and we must solve the political problem that is created by uh, the deliberate creation of tensions in the world. Uh, in that case, uh, if we do not unilaterally disarm ourselves psychologically, I believe that at the end of a, of a 10 to 15 year period, uh, the, the changes in the Soviet system that Eli, Eli Wiesel has talked about are likely to occur. Eli Wiesel? I'm afraid of madness. I'm afraid that madness is possible in history. We have seen it that occasionally madness erupts in history. And uh, the only way, I believe, to prevent that madness would be to remember. If we remember that things are possible, then I believe memory can become a shield. Mr. Buckley. We saw tonight a hypothetical catastrophe there is an ongoing catastrophe that is not hypothetical. That's life in the Soviet Union under Gulag. Uh, I very much regret the kind of drunk thought that uh, is encouraged uh, by ventures of reductionism of the kind that that movie uh, suggested. There is not that uh, in the conversation here tonight, for which I think we are all are grateful. But we have only to remember this. We have to fear the Soviet Union because they have an appetite to govern us and do to us what they have done to their wretched people. You have taken the words out of my mouth in thanking everyone here for the high level on which this <laughs> discussion has been conducted. I would also like to thank our audience for the thoughtful questions that they pose and to apologize to the many of you who I know wanted to ask questions but simply did not get the opportunity. One reason you didn't is that I have a closing thought and I would like to deliver it now. It is a paradox that the most emotional issue of our time, possibly the most emotional issue of all time, namely the potential annihilation of the human race, needs more than anything to be considered calmly and without emotion. In that respect, tonight's presentation of the day after may have been less than useful. It is difficult to be calm in the face of Armageddon. It is next to impossible to be unemotional when the apocalypse is shown to be so easily within our reach. But if the film has shed 
something of a national tendency toward complacence, then there, that is good. We need to talk about the problem. We need to examine not only as a nation, but as members of an endangered species, means toward a solution. We cannot succeed in that goal if we are rigid and doctrinaire in our approach to those with whom we disagree. What is at stake this time is much more than simply winning an argument. This coming week, Tuesday through Friday on Nightline, we will present the Crisis Game. Ten high-ranking officials who served former administrations in the military, intelligence, and in diplomacy will show you how the decision-making process at the highest level of government works, or sometimes does not work, during a time of great international crisis. Among those taking part, former Senator and Secretary of State Edmund Muskie, who will play the role of President. Former Secretary of Defense and advisor to Presidents Truman and Johnson, Clark Clifford, who will play the role of Secretary of State. And playing the role he also played in government, former Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger. The crisis game will be on Nightline this coming week, Tuesday through Friday, 11.30 p.m., 10.30 Central Time. That concludes this edition of Viewpoint. Again, my thanks to everyone here. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. Good night. From Washington, this has been an ABC News special edition of Viewpoint.